Good morning, Less Than the World. Welcome to your review video for Thursday, December the 5th, following this morning's lecture on global decolonization. This morning we explored the reasons why it is that if the late 19th century was the era of great imperial expansion, that the late 20th century is the era for the end of empires. We know that there are several reasons for this. Uh, one of the reasons is that the great empire builders of the 19th century, Britain and France most notably, are no longer great powers, having been supplanted in the Cold War context by the United States and the Soviet Union, both of whom we said, albeit slightly hypocritically, are avowed defenders of self-determination. They are anti-imperialist in some sense. We also know that in the era following both of the Great Wars, but particularly World War II and the Holocaust, the ideologies of race and uh, national superiority that had fed so much of those imperial impulses have been undermined. Britain, France, Germany, Belgium can hardly claim to be uh, the great civilizing forces uh, that they had once claimed to be in light of the destruction of the two world wars. And so we said that these processes play out in a variety of ways. We looked at them in sort of two broad categories. We talked about violent processes of independence. In this case, we were referring primarily, we referred to cases like the problems of, of the colon or the settlers in Algeria, the problem of Jewish immigrants moving into Palestine, and of course the Cold War dynamics that play themselves out in places like Vietnam. These cases could all be applied in a variety of other contexts, but they illustrate the different ways, the different reasons why decolonization sometimes devolves into incredible violence. We said also that there are other processes at work that look more like negotiation, that are relatively peaceful. Here, India's movement to independence is the sort of standard bearer, the work that Gandhi does in the mass mobilization of, of population uh, is followed, an example that's followed in many parts of Africa. We uh, particularly use the case of Kwame Nkrumah's movement towards independence in Gold Coast, or what is today the country of Ghana, right here in West Africa. And lastly, we, we concluded today with a discussion of the legacies of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, I introduced a term, the idea of neo-colonialism, that represents the kind of ongoing problem for many developing world nations, the former colonies of Britain, France, Belgium, etc., the question, of course, is whether political independence earned in the 50s and in the 60s has equated to anything like true independence, because it certainly has not meant the flourishing of these states from a developmental perspective. The challenges, we said, are many. Uh, the political structures that are introduced are often stilted, uh, prefabricated to, in some ways, favor one-party states, the control of power in the hands of a few. They have economies that are not really meant to serve the greater good, but rather inclined or able to do only one thing well, and that is export raw materials, a very fragile basis for the construction of a modern economy, as we saw in the case of Zambia. And then, of course, most poisonous of all, the problems of internal tensions, the legacies of a, of a colonial order built on division and difference and the way that that plays out. The case of Rwanda, of course, the uh, sort of most horrifying, the best known of these examples, but the processes that play out in Rwanda happen in many other parts of the world as well. All of these struggling uh, economies, these uh, struggles for true sort of stability, independence, and flourishing uh, have continued to be pressing issues in our world, and something that we'll be exploring in a little more depth as we enter our final week of class. Have a good weekend. I'll see you on Tuesday.